E3 2017 is officially done and dusted, and even though it perhaps wasn't the most inspiring of shows, Square Enix still announced a ton of different things relating to the Final Fantasy franchise, I think more than a lot of people realised. That's not too surprising though, as there are just so many different sources out there now. I mean, outside of the standard press conferences that naturally received the largest amount of focus from the gaming community, there was also the Square Enix Presents livestream, interviews that take place with publications, appearances on different streams, the E3 Coliseum, and even updates that came from employee Twitter accounts. So that's why we've compiled this video, so that you can get all the different announcements in one place, and for ease, we're even going to be going in game order. So here's 73 Final Fantasy announcements and bits of news from in or around E3 2017, starting with the City of Final Fantasy NT. Square Enix kicked things off before E3 2017 even started, as they did last year, and they did so by announcing that Dissidia Final Fantasy Arcade will be coming to the PlayStation 4 as Dissidia Final Fantasy NT. And out of all the games appearing at the show from Square Enix, this one probably had the most scattergun approach in terms of where it appeared. During the show itself, there were numerous segments that Square Enix presents, they appeared at the E3 Coliseum alongside eSports personalities, and appeared on live streams for companies like PlayStation, IGN and Twitch. They hit it hard. Anyway, moving on with the news, alongside the reveal of the game, Square Enix released a short trailer and right at the end stated that Dissidia NT would be releasing early 2018 worldwide. Later in the E3 Coliseum, Kazama kind of clarified this and said that they would try their best to release towards the early part of the year. The trailer also, as expected, revealed that the title would be appearing exclusively on the PlayStation 4. Sorry Xbox, Switch or PC gamers, but this one's on the PlayStation only for now. Now, as you'd expect, following the announcement there was a slew of different details everywhere, from an extensive post on Amazon that went live too early, and also via a live stream that was taking place in Japan. So what did we learn? Well, to start off with, we learned that in addition to the standard 3 vs 3 mode that we saw in the arcade version, there will be a new offline 1 vs 1 mode, and they will be introducing custom lobbies so that you can battle against your friends. We also learned that NT doesn't have a specific meaning, and can stand for quite a few different things like New Tale, New Trial, or New Tournament. However, during E3 proper, Square Enix North America decided to settle for just one of these options, New Tale. Legendary scenario writer Kazushige Nojima has been drafted in to write an all new story for Dissidia NT, and in terms of the story he's penned, it's set far beyond the events of both the original Dissidia and Dissidia Geodesan. However, it will act as a continuation as opposed to a reset or parallel story like we've been accustomed to. This time around, the characters remember their original world, and they remember what happened in the previous games too, and they're full of confidence this time around because of this. And on an individual character basis, the Cloud Strife in Dissidia NT is the Cloud Strife after the events of Advent Children. He therefore acts slightly differently, and his outfit during story sequences will be from that property as opposed to from the original game. But despite all of this, it was also announced that there wouldn't be a specific story mode. In the initial livestream, they revealed that you'll instead be able to experience the story through event scenes that take place, and this was later confirmed by Hazama in an interview with Famitsu. As you fight, the story will naturally tell itself, apparently. In the original announcement, we learned that there will be over 20 heroes and villains to play as, but this has since been clarified. Instead, we now know that whatever is in the arcade version will also be in the PlayStation 4 version, so by the time it launches, we will have quite a few more than 20 characters to play as. This clarification also related to stages featured in the arcade version and EX skills. They will be ported over too to the PlayStation 4 version. Now, Noctis was also announced for the game via that initial Amazon leaked listing, but there was no official confirmation via Square Enix, and this line has also now been removed from the Amazon page, so someone probably screwed up there. In terms of character progression, as you fight, your character will gain experience points and gil. These can then be used to acquire new EX skills, weapons, and skins. They didn't show it off, but said it's going to be a pretty straightforward system as they don't want it to be very complicated. Kijiraoka also revealed that they are considering revisions to the game's UI. It was intended to be quite flashy, which is a trend in the Japanese arcades, but they appreciate that it doesn't necessarily translate that well over to consoles. And speaking of the console release, the game will also include dual audio for English and Japanese, and will have text in French, Italian, German, and Spanish. And lastly on Dissidia, when Hazama and Kujiraoka hung out with Twitch, they also announced that they will be setting up an official Twitter account so you can keep up to date with everything that's going on with the game until launch and beyond. Okay, so next up we have Final Fantasy XV. 
Now, despite there being nothing significant announced for the game at E3, there were still a fair few updates, and things kicked off before E3 even started as Kenichi Shida, who's a game design section manager on Final Fantasy XV, took part in a live stream in Yokohama to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Final Fantasy. First up, he spoke about the Regalia Type D and the fact we would be getting it pretty soon. Now this was teased back in January and they've been working on it since. There have been some slight tweaks made since the reveal, such as increasing the wheel size, but apart from that it's pretty self-explanatory, it will allow you to take the Regalia off-road. In addition to this, we learnt from Rayo Mitsuno, who's the global brand manager for Business Division 2, that the Regalia Type D will also have a built-in jump mode, and it will be able to unlock the Regalia Type D once the patch lands by visiting Hammerhead. Kenichi Shida also revealed that this rather comical cup noodle outfit will be made available at the same time as the Regalia Type D. The update will go live late June, but it will presumably go live on the same day as Episode Prompto is released, as previous updates have also gone live alongside downloadable content. Going off on a slight tangent, during the Microsoft press conference, Phil Spencer revealed that Final Fantasy XV will be one of the titles that will be supporting the Xbox One X 4K capabilities through a free update. And Mitsuno revealed during the Final Fantasy XV Universe segment that the footage we saw during the conference was actually Final Fantasy XV running on Xbox One X, as opposed to stock footage from the standard version of the game. He also stated that they will be looking to have the free patch for Xbox One X 4K support ready to release on launch day for the new console. And while they aren't prepared to talk about Episode Ignis right now, they will be sharing more updates on the Final Fantasy XV Universe in general at Gamescom. Mitsuno said that they will be looking to announce a couple more things in the Final Fantasy XV universe at the event, which of course takes place in late August. Which offers us a nice segue onto Episode Prompto! Now, it might seem like an absolute age since Episode Prompto was initially dated as coming out in June 2017, but we finally got a release date for this piece of DLC right at the start of E3, but there wasn't a big song and dance about it. No, they actually announced the release date subtly in a Final Fantasy XV universe trailer with this small piece of text. Kenichi Shida also announced during its appearance at the Final Fantasy 30th anniversary livestream that Naoshi Mizuta would be appearing as a guest composer for Episode Prompto, and during E3 they published a second trailer, this time with English subtitles, where Mizuta talked about what it was like to write the music and also work with Tabata. Going as spoiler free as we can, we also learned that the story of Episode Prompto takes place when he is separated from the party. He ends up in an Imperial base where a lot of the Magitech soldiers are created, and he has to fight his way out so that he can rejoin Noctis, Gladiolus and Ignis. As he's doing so, he will be able to acquire a few new weapons. Two we've seen so far are the Sagita Rifle and the Rapidus SMG. Once you pick these weapons up, you will be able to assign them and switch between them at will. And we saw that should you choose to use weapons like the Rapidus, you will need to make sure that ammo is replenished by picking up weapons from enemies. However, it's worth noting that Prompto's trusty handgun will have unlimited ammunition. Using Prompto's guns, you will also be able to shoot parts of the scenery to cause explosions and defeat numerous enemies at the same time. But should you choose to, you can perform melee attacks and even stealth kills. Oh, and you can take selfies too. In terms of the content you'll find within the DLC pack, outside of running through the Imperial base shooting things, there will also be a section where you get to drive around in a snowmobile. And according to Mitsuno, the experience should last at least two hours. However, unlike Episode Gladiolus, where things were quite straightforward, Episode Pronto will feature missions that you can accomplish as you play through, which will apparently extend the experience beyond the two hour mark. There will also be different modes you can play through, for example, there will be a time attack mode, the snowmobile section. Alright, now we're going to move on to something new in the Final Fantasy XV universe, Monster of the Deep, Final Fantasy XV. Monster of the Deep was announced during the Sony press conference as the new name for what was previously dubbed as the Final Fantasy XV VR experience. It was met with a rather tentative response from the audience, but online, fans have been a little more vocal. For example, on the official PlayStation YouTube channel, the announcement trailer has received about 70% dislikes, but they've been a little bit more forgiving closer to home, with the same trailer receiving a much better ratio on the official Final Fantasy XV YouTube channel. Either way, outside of the name, quite a few things were revealed about the game. For one, it's no longer a gun game, it's now a VR fishing action experience. And it's been built from the ground up, as opposed to just being the existing fishing game ported into VR. And it will therefore be releasing as a standalone title, as opposed to a DLC expansion for the main game. It will be releasing this September exclusively on the PlayStation 4. Now, unlike the rest of the Final Fantasy XV experience, you won't play as any of the four characters, and they will instead fish alongside you. And while the game will primarily be about fishing, the developers have integrated combat elements into the game too. If you fish out one of the demon fish, for example like the one that appears in the key art, 
then you'll have to stun it using a crossbow. Also, outside of the pond shown in the trailer, you'll be able to fish in multiple locations, although no specifics were given around this at this time. Okay, next up we have King's Knight Wrath of the Dark Dragon. Before we get onto the news, a lot of the media seem to forget that this game was actually announced last September and are acting like it was something new, like Eurogamer here for example, but we know better than that. We're therefore chalking this up as a re-announcement of the game, or simply a reminder that it still exists if you will. King's Knight was actually playable on the show floor, but the only news of any note was that it's still scheduled to release in 2017 on iOS and Android. Oh, and that literally anyone who played it at E3 got given a free t-shirt to help promote the game. Alright, now for Final Fantasy XIV, which we'll cover at a very top level. Alright, so this month is obviously pretty huge for Final Fantasy XIV due to release of the game's second expansion, Stormblood, on the 20th of June. And to celebrate this, Square Enix released a trailer on the 7th of June, about a week before E3 started. It set the scene perfectly from a narrative perspective, and it got everyone buzzing about the launch of Stormblood. They also announced that they will be creating some real world escape rooms called Trials of Bahamut, where people will need to form groups of six to solve puzzles and save the day before Bahamut awakens. This starts in LA before sweeping across America and ending on the 21st of October in New York. During the Letter from the Producer Live at E3 2017, Yoshida announced that there will be a new world called Omega, which will be opening on the European data center in the future. And with the start of the early access for Stormblood on the 16th of June, support for the PlayStation 3 version of Final Fantasy XIV officially ended. So if you want to play the game now, it's PC or PlayStation 4 only. Our next title, Final Fantasy Brave Exvius, was something of a surprise having three segments throughout the three days of Square Enix Presents. And it was during the first of these segments that Kei Hirono announced that they will be conducting a Final Fantasy XII in-game event in July to celebrate the release of Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age. As a result, Ash and Rassler will be added into the global game as special characters. Judge Zargabath will also be coming to the game as the first global exclusive character, but they assure Japanese players that he will be added to their game at some point in the near future. Hiroki Fujimoto also revealed that there will be a big update launch on the 22nd of June in preparation for the first anniversary of the game's global version. It will add a new global exclusive feature called Expeditions, where players can send off units to retrieve items, and they can also do this when the app is closed, but it's not always a successful thing. The update will also allow players to acquire EX points following the purchase of lapis or bundles, and it also added new dungeon tiers. Also, as part of the first anniversary campaign, between the 29th of June and the 13th of July, they will be giving players a guaranteed 5 star unit. Also, between the 29th of June and the 26th of July, they will be giving players a free rare summon every day. The 29th of June will also see the addition of special characters Tidus, Wacker and Riku into the global game alongside a Final Fantasy X themed event. And for Japanese fans, they will be doing a special Final Fantasy XV themed event towards the end of the month due to the release of Episode Prompto. And now we're going to move on to the other big mobile title at E3, Mobius Final Fantasy. Before E3 even started, they announced another Mobius collaboration to celebrate the relaunch of Final Fantasy XIV Stormblood. It runs from the 9th of June through to the 12th of July, and as part of this, Ultima Weapon, including the music they used in Final Fantasy XIV, has been faithfully recreated for the game's multiplayer component. Something which also started on the 9th of June was the Welcome Back campaign. Depending on how many players rejoin the game, there will be different rewards and even those who are already playing will receive benefits. Yuma Watanabe, marketing director for Mobius Final Fantasy, announced Final Fantasy XII Light of the Skies, a crossover event to celebrate the Zodiac Age. It will feature an original story and it will be filled with plenty of different elements from Final Fantasy XII, such as the judges themselves, Mandragoras and the Stral. And as part of the update, Judge Magister will appear as a legendary job for your character. In Japan, they will be doing a separate event for Final Fantasy XII and they hope people will keep an eye out for upcoming announcements. And they're also planning to do some cool initiatives to mark the first anniversary of the global version in August. For example, they want to give players Magicite drops in normal battles. Alright, next up we have Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age. Following the release of a story trailer on the 8th of June, Hiroki Kato, the producer on Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age, did a write up about the game on the PlayStation blog. In this, he revealed that The Zodiac Age will not only be in HD, it will also support the PlayStation 4 Pro. And when US Gamer spoke to Kato at E3, he also reconfirmed that if things go well for The Zodiac Age, then they will seriously consider whether they want to make another game set in Ivalice. He noted that as a lot of the team have reassembled to work on this project, it's opened the door for future titles should there be enough demand within the community. Square Enix also released a new piece of key art for the Zodiac Age, drawn by Hideo Manaba, who actually left Square Enix back in 2004, but was the co-art director on the original Final Fantasy XII and International Zodiac Job System. It doesn't stop there though, as we've got two more news pieces. 
First up, during that Final Fantasy 30th anniversary livestream we spoke about a while ago now, they announced that Pitlogica Final Fantasy will be coming to the Nintendo DS on the 12th of July in Japan. It was actually released on mobile devices back in 2013, but Square Enix has now decided to make it a free download on the Nintendo eShop. And finally, although it's not strictly related to Final Fantasy, Hironobu Sakaguchi has announced that he'll be revealing Mistwalker's newest title on the 22nd of June via a Famitsu livestream. There will also be a guest appearance by legendary Final Fantasy composer Nobuo Uematsu also on the stream. Alright guys, so that's all the major Final Fantasy announcements and bits of news from in and around E3 2017. Keep your eyes peeled though, as I expect there to be much more in the coming days and weeks as interviews start to surface. There have already been some for Final Fantasy XIV for example. Honestly though, I think it's a real shame that the Final Fantasy VII Remake didn't make any kind of appearance, but given everything that happened in the weeks before E3, it's not too surprising. However, it will be interesting to see whether Nomura sticks to his plan of doing a major update for the game at an event this year, or whether those plans have just now been shelved. Anyway, how do you guys feel about this E3 as a whole? Were you disappointed, or did you think it was really good? And what did you think was the biggest news they ended up announcing at the show? Let us know in the comments below, and if you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button and subscribe! And if you'd like to support our channel, please head over to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash ffunion. These amazing folks have already done so, so why not join them? Alright guys, thank you so much for watching this rather lengthy video. This is Daryl signing out, I will see you all next time.